Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have finished the study of the seven churches, and uh, Tony thought it would be appropriate if I gave you just in a few pithy words the message that Jesus gave to each one of those churches, so it's in your uh, notes here today for your memory, so you can remember them. Because these were actual and real churches in John's day, and uh, Jesus wrote those letters to these churches which were alive and somewhat well, some half dead, others were doing well. But they also represented all churches from Pentecost to the catching away of the church, which we'll talk more about today. So we are now entering into what I would call the two of the most dramatic chapters in the Bible. I hope I'm not overstating that because you know, every chapter, every verse has meaning. But these two chapters are the supreme headquarters of the universe. Now, if that doesn't get your <laughs> excitement up, it should. Because this is where God runs the universe. Not just here on this earth, but everything that's out there that he's ever created since before we can even think about because God has always been. I have a hard time identifying with eternity past. I have a hard enough time identifying with eternity future, that we're going to live forever, but eternity past just escapes my mind, <laughs> that God has always been. So I think we're going to find out someday uh, what he has been doing for eternity past, and I think that we will be discovering that throughout an eternity future. So Revelation chapter 4, the supreme headquarters of God. You know, foretelling the future is big, big news. It's also big business. The most famous of all the foretellers was Notre Dame. Probably heard of that guy. A French astrologer, physician, and reputed seer. He published a book in 1555 of 942 future predictions that observers say a few came true. A few. Now, if I or you listed 942 predictions, you probably would hit the mark a few times. And I think it was about four that they said. And there are horoscopes, palm readers, astrologers, psychics, soothsayers making big bucks predicting the future with about as much success as a fortune cookie. But yet people keep putting down money to hear what they have to say. <clears throat> but our society has largely ignored the only reliable source of future events, and that's the Bible. You know, a third of the Bible is prophecy. And most of that third of the Bible, those prophecies have been already fulfilled at a 100% accuracy rate. In fact, in the Old Testament, if a prophet didn't, his prediction did not come true, what happened to him? Stoned. He was stoned. He was killed. So what we have written here in the Bible is going to happen. You can take that to the bank or wherever else you want to take it. The book we are studying now is almost entirely about the future, except for chapters 2 and 3 in the churches, and they're kind of about the future because the, the history of the church extends on out until the catching away of the church. And if our God is trustworthy as he has proven to be from Genesis 1-1 right up to today, he will also be 100% re re uh, reliable throughout eternity, not only to the end. We now come to the third division of the book of <laughs> Revelation. The first division, in fact, these divisions are found in Revelation 119. It said, Jesus, Jesus told John, or the angel told John, write the things you have seen. That was chapter one. What did he see in chapter one? He saw an appearance or a vision of Jesus Christ himself dressed in his priestly, high priestly garment. 
And then he said, write the things that are now, and that was chapters two and three, which was the churches. We've just been through those. And then he said, write the things that will take place later. That's beginning today, chapter four, through the end of the book, chapter 22. So with that, let's jump into chapter four, verse one. John writing said, after these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. I want to note the word trumpet because whenever there's a voice like a trumpet, it speaks of the grace of God. Whenever there was a voice like thunder, it speaks of the judgment of God. So here we know that grace is still ruling in this world. This passage begins with after these things, after what things? Again, the church age until the church is taken out of this world. And the scene abruptly shifts from earth to heaven. You know, the only time we can do that today is we turn on the TV and they can take you here, there, and everywhere else. This is like a TV program way before it's time because it's on earth showing us what's happening. Then all of a sudden it shifts up into heaven. So up until this particular time, the church has been mentioned 19 times. We will not see it mentioned again in this entire book. So what happened to the church? Well, we're going to see what happened to the church. Well, the fact is, I'll give you a little tip here before we get into it. The church has been taken out of this world. So why is it not called the church anymore? Because it's no longer the church. It is now the bride of Christ, adorned and ready for the glorious wedding that we're going to have in heaven. John first sees an open door. By the way, he's not the first biblical prophet that peered into heaven from earth. Ezekiel actually saw and peered into heaven. You read chapter 1. That's a dramatic chapter as well. Daniel and Isaiah also did so. But he was the only one who was summoned into heaven. They just looked into heaven and reported back what he saw. Now, I know I always get in trouble when I say this, but there have been hundreds of books now written about people that have traveled to heaven and they saw all these scenes and they met all their relatives and friends and whatever and came back and wrote a book about it. I'm very skeptical of those books. Now, <clears throat> I believe they could have a, had a vision of heaven. I even think I had one when my father passed away because I saw, it, saw him. He was lively and he was happy and he had had a hard time towards the end. I just don't believe in they traveled there and saw these things and reported back. John the Apostle is the only one that did that. Now there was another one, the Apostle Paul, if you remember, that said he went up into the third heaven. But guess what? What did he tell us about it? Nada. Nothing. He said he couldn't tell us about it. So I have a lot of other things I could share with you, but I, that's not the, the sense of the lesson today. Now, many Bible scholars and I agree that John, as he is called up into heaven, represents the church, which will be called out of this world into heaven an event, as we know, as the rapture. It's found, Paul wrote about it in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. I've often wondered where Paul got his information about the rapture of the church. Jesus never talked about it. Uh, there are other writings in the Old Testament about it. Well, remember, he was three years in the desert training for his mission. The Lord could have visited with him there, and he was also up into heaven. So he got that information from God. What John sees from his heavenly view is what the church will view after it is caught away to be with Christ. In eternity, there will be no time. I believe there will be a sequence of events in eternity because 
I don't think we can identify with all this information at once. I just don't have the concept that only God can do that because he's omniscient. But I believe that as John writes this book, he says after these things, and he gives us another event, that it, we will always have some sequence of events of things that are happening, even though time will be no more. <clears throat> now, some people uh, have different views of heaven. I don't know what your views have always been, but some people describe heaven as uh, floating on a cloud, playing a harp. I frankly can't get excited about that. I don't know about you. <laughs> you can get a ride at Disneyland that'll be more exciting than that. <laughs> But, uh, you know, some kind of take things here and they put them up there, like uh, a golfer may say, well, there's gonna be the best golf course that ever existed up there in the sky, and I'm gonna shoot par. <laughs> or a cowboy could say there's gonna be the great roundup in the sky. Uh, all these different things. Now me, the only thing I've ever thought of about heaven, see, when I was young, I played basketball. In fact, I played basketball until I was in my 50s. I loved the game. Now, I, when I started, I couldn't keep up with the kids anymore. I had to quit. But I always wanted to dunk the basketball, get up over the rim, and stuff it in there. I never could jump that high. I wasn't tall enough. I always thought in heaven, I can dunk with my feet if I want to. <laughs> But the main thing is heaven is a real dimension of existence and it exists in the here and now. All those who have left us from this class that have gone on to heaven have gone to this real place that exists in the here and now. Now first I want to talk a little bit about this open doors that are in Revelation. There are four open doors in Revelation. In chapter 3, verse 8, uh, to the church in Philadelphia, remember, he said, I have set before you an open door. And I believe that's a door of opportunity where they had to get out the gospel to their world in that day, and we have the same opportunity today. Secondly, there's chapter 3, verse 20, where Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. You remember last week? That's the door of the heart. Number three, here we have an open door which every redeemed person will go through to enter heaven. How are they gonna get there? Well, I've often thought, uh, where is heaven? Well, we don't know. We, it's always referred to as up and hell referred to as down, right? But here's what I know because remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man died and went to Hades, and Lazarus died and went to Abraham's bosom, which is a picture of the Jew of heaven. You know how he got there? An angel showed up and took him there. So you don't need to worry. You'll be able to get there. And you remember Stephen? In the book of Acts, I always thought this was very dramatic because when he was being stoned to death, he looked up into heaven and saw Jesus standing there waiting to receive him. I believe that every believer will, Jesus will be there to greet you when you go to heaven. In chapter 19, verse 11, we see a door open in heaven again, toward the end of the book, and that will be the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes down here at the end of the tribulation period to put down all rebellion that's here in the world. Now the headquarters of heaven. But before I do that, I was trying to think of an example, and this is a tiny one, about what we're gonna see in heaven. Tony and I got to spend some time in London years ago, and uh, we got to visit uh, Churchill's bunker underneath 10 Downing Street, where he ran the war in Europe from the beginning to the end. You see, the Germans were bombing all these different places there, he had no idea. He was right there in the center of London, down in a bunker. And when you go through this bunker, you go and look on the wall, and it'll tell every event in World War II, event by event by event. And they have all these maps and all of these things where Churchill had this 
Supreme Headquarters here during World War II. That's the closest and smallest thing I could think about to relate to this. So let's go to this tremendous event. Chapter 4, verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. It says he was in the spirit. I've always wondered, as many theologians have, did John actually go physically into heaven or did just his spirit go there and his body stayed here? Well, I think he went physically into heaven. Now it says he was in the spirit, but in some of the earlier translations, he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. We should all be in the spirit on the Lord's day. That's when we are in the spirit on the Lord's day, we can hear the, hear the spirit talking to us. But tell me how a spirit can have quill and parchment and write things. I don't understand how that could happen. Well, it could certainly be a miracle, but I believe that he was literally taken up to heaven, although he was in the spirit. Here's the supreme headquarters of the universe. The first time John saw, the first thing he saw was a great throne, and someone seated on it. The throne is a central theme of the book of Revelation out of the 22 chapters there are only five chapters that a throne is not mentioned. Why is that? Well, <laughs> there's a reason for that. You see, the government of God towers over all human events, and he wants to keep telling us. He's in charge. He sees everything. He's on the throne. The fact that there is a God, and he is on the throne of the universe, goes against the grain and thinking of modern man. You see, he does not like the idea of a throne of cosmic authority because that means there are absolutes which cannot be changed. And as you know, this generation, many are trying to update the Bible, to change the Constitution, to change history and do all those things. They don't like the idea that there are absolutes that cannot be changed. Jeremiah said this, a glorious throne exalted from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. That's pretty good. So who's the figure seated on the throne? We say at last we think we can learn what God looks like. Story of the little girl, which you probably have heard many times in an art class and the professor has told the kids to draw a picture of their favorite person. So he comes by and this little girl, he says, well, who are you drawing a picture of? She said, of God. She sa he says, well, nobody knows what God look, looks like. She says, they will when I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> so what does John see? Colors. That's Christ. all he sees. Christ. Colors. Just colors. 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 Moses was told no one can see the face of God and live. Not even John. Well, you say John saw Jesus, he walked with him. Jesus was veiled in human flesh. No one has seen the Godhead, the Trinity, and live. We've seen manifestations of his being, lots of places, but we've never seen, no one has ever seen the Godhead. John saw a figure on the throne, but it, it was lost in dazzling lights that surrounded the throne. Compare the vision of John to the vision of Ezekiel in chapter 1 in the Old Testament. It's very similar. Like John, Ezekiel gives us no description of God's features, just simulating brilliant light. You know, the, God, the Bible tells us God is light. So let's kind of break this down. We do learn from the colors several important things. First of all, we learn that it is not merely God the Father on the throne. 
there are actually three persons manifested there. The first was like a jasper stone, and we know that today to be a diamond, kind of the king or queen of stones. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, they say, because diamonds, they sparkle, they reflect light. It is a magnificent stone, and that represented God the Father. What do we see next is the sardius stone, which is a beautiful, glowing, blood red stone. Who do you think that represented? Jesus. Jesus. No question about it. The third stone is the emerald. John saw a great rainbow encircling the throne. Have you ever seen a complete rainbow in a complete circle? You almost have to be in a plane or a missile or something to see it. I, we've actually seen it because, you know, we used to drive to Sun Valley and we see these beautiful rainbows after the rain. A rainbow is a circle. It's not just one of these. Yeah. Green is the color of nature, the color of creation. Remember in Genesis 1.1, it said, and God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and what happens next? The Spirit of God was brooding over the waters. He was creating those waters. He was making them. You say, well, I thought Jesus created the heavens and the earth. He did. I thought the Father. He did. But the Holy Spirit was the agent of creation. So the color of green or the color of nature represents the Holy Spirit. By the way, the Holy Spirit is also the agent of the new creation. When we are born again of the Spirit, He is the agent of the second creation as well. Verse 4. Around the throne were 24 elders. I'm sorry, 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So who are the 24 elders? Well, there's been debate on this for years, but here's my take on it, and I think uh, most Bible scholars agree with this today. The elders in the, old, in the Bible were representatives in the Old Testament of Israel. Remember, there were 70 elders that represented the entire nation. That's where the Sahedrin got their 70 number from in the New Testament. And the church, the New Testament church, were appointed elders to oversee the church. Titus 1.5. So I believe these 24 elders were representing the total church from Pentecost to the rapture of the church. Remember, the church has now gone to heaven, but they're not called a church. These are just representatives of the church. And it says they wore white raiment, and that was representing the righteousness of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.21. They also had crowns of gold, which indicates the church will rule and reign with Christ in eternity, 1 Corinthians 6.3. Going on to verse 5, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices, Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, which represents the Holy Spirit. You know, all this is beyond my understanding and maybe yours. So God communicates through symbols or pictures that we can understand. These sounds are symbols of judgment from God. At the end of human history, when the church is removed, God turns from grace to judgment. Now, not that grace is not still there, but the focus during the church age for some 2,000 years, and will be until the church is taken out, is grace. We call it the age of grace, or the age of the church. But the seven years which follow are going to be an age of judgment, and a time of judgment. Someone said, the first theological statement came from my mom. She said, may God help you if you do that again. <laughs> well, that's kind of what God's saying. Time's up. 
I can't do that anymore. These, these symbols of judgment are repeated over and over again as we see in God's final judgment against the world's evil. Now we're going to see four weird symbolic creatures starting in verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The sea of glass denotes its appearance and not the actual material, which we're going to see a lot of these symbols in Revelation. The sea represents the holiness and righteousness of God. Matthew 5, 8 and Hebrews 12, 14. Again, the emphasis is not on mercy, but the judgment of God. <coughs> there are two interpretations of who these living creatures are. One is that they represent the animal kingdom. I discount that, but there are some that teach that. The second is they represent the angelic beings. That's the one that I believe. See, God created two groups of highly intelligent beings that we know of, humans and angelic. That's it. Now, <clears throat> angels now are more powerful than humans. We know that by reading the Bible. But someday it says that we will <clears throat> judge angels. Now, I don't know what that means, Unless we all have a guardian angel and we get to sit down with them and say, you didn't do a very good job here or there. I don't know. <laughs> I'm guessing at that. But it says we will judge angels. Because we're created in the image of God, we will be higher than angels in eternity. Now, there are other references to similar beings in the Old Testament, as I've just described, in Ezekiel and Isaiah, which are definitely angelic. That's why I take that position. We see the seraphim and the cherubim and these two, these two prophets, which are the highest rank of angelic beings. By the way, God always has ranks. You know, the angels were in ranks, we're in ranks. I think they will we'll be in ranks in heaven. I think some of us will start in grammar school and some of us will start in high school, college, and it'll be all over the board depending upon your knowledge of the Bible because I believe we'll be learning about God throughout eternity, which will be exciting. If there's no learning at all, well, you know, what would you do? Anyway, there are also archangels, which are one of the ranks. Some say they were second in rank, some say they were fourth, depending on who you're reading. But only two of the archangels are named. What are the two? Gabriel and Michael, of course we don't have. Now the other reason we will find in verse 8 that I believe these are angelic beings. But first let's get to verse 7. It says, The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf or an ox, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. What does that mean? Most scholars believe this has a reference to the four Gospels. Each one of the Gospels presents a different aspect of our Lord Jesus Christ. The face of a lion, a lion is what? The king of beasts? Which is the Gospel of Matthew, because Matthew presents Jesus as king. Secondly, he had a face like an ox or a calf, which is a beast of burden. And Mark presents Jesus as a servant. Third, the third is the face of a man, and Luke presents Jesus as what? The Son of Man. And the fourth is a flying eagle, which represents deity, so John presents Jesus as the Son of God. Verse 8. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. 
These six wings correspond to the seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. And the refrain that's repeatedly here is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who is the same frame in Isaiah 6, 3, which was and is and is to come, refers to Christ and the way he introduced himself in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I'm going to go back and read that to refresh your memory. In verse 8, when G he, Jesus introduced himself to John, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Verse 9, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, and this is your key verse today, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. That's one of the key verses in all the Bible. Why were we here? Why were we created? This verse right here tells us why we were created. Note the four living creatures, the angelic beings, lead and worship. I just don't see this being the animal kingdom leading the church in worship. This is the first great worship scene we see in heaven. It won't be the last, but the first. There will be a lot of things we will do in heaven. Uh, we know that. We're going to rule and reign, and we're going to have things to investigate throughout eternity. But we only have a glimpse today of what we're going to do. And Paul, and I, I quoted this before, but I, I want to quote it again. It says, he wrote, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Isn't that exciting? But the number one thing we will do and our hearts will desire is to worship him. Some people say, I, I struggle with that. Well, you won't struggle in heaven. That's what you will want to do. I'm going to read something uh, by Eugene Peterson that he wrote about worship. Then we're gonna do something a little bit different. You know, we change things around at the end occasionally. And that is, we're going to listen to a worship song that correlates with this chapter. And you can either sing along with it, you can just be quiet and worship, or you can just be quiet, whatever the Spirit leads you to do. But think about this as boot camp for heaven, practicing worship. Here's what Eugene Peterson said about worship. He said, that true worship accomplishes five specific functions. Number one, true worship centers our attention. We are truly worshiping God when we see him, not our own ego as the center of everything. Number two, true worship gathers people together. We like to worship corporately with other people. Number three, true worship reveals truth. As we truly worship, we begin to understand things as we've never seen before. For true worship makes us sing. We can't help it. We can't hold it back. Worshiping Christians are always singing. Christians can even sing when others weep. Number five, true worship affirms. As we truly worship, we respond to God's great promises with a resounding amen. Amen. <laughs> 